Hi students, in this video, we are going to look at the experimental techniques. So don't confuse these with the separation techniques. Okay, the first thing we are going to look for is the solubility and density of gases. Okay, so first of all, we need to know how to collect gases that are produced in the chemical reaction. So we collect these gases based on solubility and density. Okay, so these few are the common gases that we will always see in the lab moving forward. Okay, and then we have their solubility here and the density here. So when we talk about the density of these gases, we are looking at the density comparing it with air, the surrounding air that is around us. Okay, so surrounding air is made up of 78% nitrogen and then 21% oxygen. Okay, so this is my O2 and then N2. Okay, and then we have 1% other gases, such as your CO2, water vapor, etc. Okay, so the bulk of air is actually made up of nitrogen and oxygen. Okay, so we are going to do a simple calculation to see how dense air is, right? So 78% is 0.78. I multiply it by the relative atomic mass of nitrogen. The nitrogen, if you look at the periodic table, is 14. Uh, because two atoms of nitrogen N2, it will be 28. So I take the percentage, which is 0.78, multiply by the relative atomic mass of nitrogen plus percentage of oxygen, which is 0.21, I multiply it by the relative atomic mass of oxygen, which is 16 plus 16 is 32. Okay, this will give me an approximate value of about 28.56. Okay, so this is the approximate density of air around us, or rather the approximate relative atomic mass of air. Okay, then let's look at each of these gases and we will see. So we have ammonia by now, we have to know it's NH3. I add up all the relative atomic mass, 17 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. Sorry, uh, nitrogen is 14. So total, I will get 17. Okay, so from this value, I can see that my ammonia is less dense than air, right? So that's why we have less dense. Okay, using the same logic, I can go and count the relative atomic mass of all the gases. So HCl, hydrogen chloride, is 1 plus 35.5. Okay, sulfur dioxide SO2 is... 32 plus 16 plus 16. And then CO2 is 12 plus 16 plus 16. Okay, so chlorine is diatomic Cl2. This is 35.5 plus 35.5. Okay, oxygen O2 is 16 plus 16. And then H2 is 1 plus 1. Okay, so let's compare this relative atomic mass with air and then we can see which gas is more or less dense than air. So just now I was looking at the less dense ammonia and then I also have less dense which is my hydrogen. So over here. Okay, so if we look at it, the rest of these gases based on your calculations over here are more dense than air. Okay. So based on this density, we have to collect these gases in the experimental setup. We collect it using three methods over here. Number one, we have this downward delivery. So downward delivery is because my gas is collected here at the downside below bottom and air gets displaced on top and escapes. Okay, so for this to work, it must be more dense than air. So as it is more dense, the gas that's more dense, it will sink to the bottom. And I can collect it using downward delivery. So all these gases that we just counted, HCl, SO2, CO2, Cl2, right? All these gases, we can use downward delivery. 
Okay, the opposite is true. We have this upward delivery. Okay, upward delivery, same thing, my gas is on top over here, and the air is displaced over here, this part. Okay, so the gas is collected on top, it must be less dense than air. So we have your ammonia, hydrogen gas as well. Okay, and then we will talk about the solubility in water. So this gas, the one that is very insoluble, is hydrogen, all right? Then we have other gases that are slightly soluble, okay? So these gases, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, oxygen, okay? Because they are slightly soluble or insoluble, we can use the method called water displacement, okay? So in this setup, gas is being produced over here, Right, since the gas will pass through do this delivery tube and then there's water. Since the gases are not soluble in water, I can collect the gas over here because they cannot dissolve in water, they will collect on top. So these three gases are the most common gases that is collected using water displacement. Okay, next part we are going to look at is the drying of gases. So to dry gases, we can use three drying agents in the lab which is my concentrated sulfuric acid, H2SO4, quick lime, which is my calcium oxide, and then fused calcium chloride, okay, CaCl2. Okay, so concentrated sulfuric acid, this one we have to know, this is acidic. Okay, so since it is acidic, I cannot use to dry ammonia because ammonia, by now we have to know this is alkaline. Okay, so I cannot use to dry ammonia because alkaline will react with acid to give me salt and water. So it reacts away, it doesn't dry ammonia. Okay, quick line, calcium oxide. This is a metal oxide. By now, we have to know metal oxides are bases. I keep repeating this, please note. Okay, so bases will react with acid to give salt and water, right? So I cannot use the calcium oxide since it's a base. I cannot use it to dry acidic gases, okay? I can use it to dry ammonia because ammonia is alkaline in nature and it is just a soluble base, okay? Acidic gases, what are they? CO2. SO2, HCl, Cl2. So if I look at my CO2, SO2, again, these are what we call non-metal oxide. Non-metal oxide. Non-metal oxides, these are acidic. Okay, so since these are acidic, it will react with the base, which is my calcium oxide. It cannot be used to dry these acidic gases. Okay, alternatively, we also have calcium chloride. This one is to dry most gases except ammonia. Okay, so let's look at this experimental setup over here, right? So typically, we will pour up your sulfuric acid inside. Okay, gas that is being produced in the experiment setup over here passes through the delivery tube, goes all the way in, escapes into the H2SO4, dries it, and then escapes back out. So the gas collected will be dry. Okay, calcium oxide, we will use this method, right? Gas goes in through, pass through my calcium oxide, and gets collected over here. Okay, fuse calcium chloride, this one enters here, just dry all the way through, and then escapes here. Okay, so these are the methods to dry gases. All right, okay. Other experimental techniques that we have to know, measuring volume of gas. Okay, the first one, this one that we learned, this is collecting the gas. I never measure how much gas is being collected, right? To measure how much gas is collected, I have to use a gas switch, okay? Measuring loss of reactants, okay, or I measure how much reactants are left behind. I will use a 
electronic ballots. Okay, so most of the time, like in an acid uh, metal reaction or acid carbonate reaction, carbon dioxide and hydrogen gas is being produced. So the gas escapes, the salt will be left behind over here. So this one will decrease the reading. Okay, usually I will connect the bottom U at the top. This one is to prevent acid spray or the evaporation of reagents. Okay, so acid spray really just means because the reaction is very vigorous, sometimes it will spray out and then it makes your reading not accurate. So putting it a cotton wool will make it a little bit more accurate. Okay, this one shouldn't read measuring of loss of mass because it's repetitive. This one is actually heating, volatile liquids. Okay, so volatile could be a new term. Volatile really means they turn into gas very easily. Okay. So we never heat volatile or flammable liquid over the flame directly. Okay, so volatile, flammable, generally they have low melting point, low boiling point because they turn into gas very easily and then the gas will diffuse so I can actually smell it and that's the meaning of volatile. Okay, so what do I do? I don't heat it directly. I don't heat it directly. I will apply indirect heating. So I should heat the water over here and then off, once your water boils, off it and then use this boiling water to heat the volatile liquid over here. Okay. If I apply direct heating, the whole thing will either evaporate very rapidly or because it's flammable like your alcohol, it will catch fire. Okay. So these are common examples of volatile liquid. Okay, last but not least, we have your Bunsen burner. So we call your Bunsen burner, right? Air holes are open fully, so I open it fully. This is a heating flame. I use it to heat. When I open the air hole completely, I allow all the oxygen to rush in for burning, for combustion. So we say this is complete combustion. Okay, when I have complete combustion, it will give me carbon dioxide and water vapor as your products. Okay, so with this heating flame, I get a blue flame and it is steady. Blue flame, I cannot really observe it very clearly because it's a very pale blue, right? We call it non-luminous, okay? And then the temperature goes up to more than 400 degrees. And then we also have the other flame, right, where the air holes are closed or half open. So look at the air hole, it's closed or half open. If it's half open and closed, the oxygen doesn't enter it as readily, right, the O2 cannot enter as readily. So this is what we call incomplete combustion. So incomplete combustion, I get soot, which is carbon, and essentially that's the burnt stuff that we see, right, instead of getting CO2, you know, your carbon only gains one oxygen to give me my carbon monoxide, okay? And then this flame is typically what we call a safety flame. I don't use it to heat, right? And it's usually not steady. The flame is flickering, okay? And then once I close the air hole, the flame will turn from blue to yellow. So yellow is bright. We can see quite readily. This is what we call your luminous flame. Okay, and then the temperature goes up to about 200 degrees only.